Good afternoon and welcome to the Dr. Cog board work session for Wednesday, February 1st, 2023. This is Dr. Cog Vice Chair Steve Conklin, Chair of this meeting. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, with that call to order, we will go to public comment if there is any. Melinda, if you could let me know if there's anyone uh, wishing to give public comment. And information on that appears on the screen. Yes, sir. Uh, currently at the moment, I do not see any hands raised. We'll give it just a moment here. Okay, we'll go ahead and move forward. With that, you'll note uh, that you have received a summary of the December 7th, 2022 board work session as attachment A. Are there any questions or comments on that? Okay, with that, we will continue to item number four, which is the fiscal year 2024-25 Unified Planning Work Program or the UPWP Development Update with Ron Papstorp. Mr. Papstorp. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ron Papstorf, Tri-Station Planning and Operations Director. I'm joined to this afternoon by Todd Cottrell, our Manager of Project and Program Delivery, and Josh Schwenk, Transportation Planner, who works with Todd um, on our Transportation Improvement Program and UPWP work. Um, I wanted, We're here this afternoon just to give you a briefing on our work to develop the next two-year work program uh, for fiscal years 24 and 25. That will begin October 1st of 2023 and go through September of 2024. Um, we, um, as the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Denver region, we this is this is our this is how we're going to spend our planning resources and um, efforts over the over the next two year period to address. Uh, both federal requirements and our regional priorities around transportation. So I'm going to give a quick refresher course on sort of a high level overview of our role as a metropolitan planning organization um, and what that entails um, to ground you in the things that we include in a unified planning work program or UPWP. Um, Todd is going to give you a quick overview of our current UPWP, which expires or ends um, uh, at the end of September of this year. And then we're going to go through a little bit of a an exercise to get some input from the board at, to inform sort of our efforts to develop a draft UPWP that will come back to you for adoption later this year. So with that, if, uh, Josh is running the show, I think. So um, just going to, again, high level overview. One of the things as the MPO uh, that we have to do is develop this unified planning work program. We get a, we get specific federal transportation dollars called planning funds to perform our work as an MPO for the region. And so one of the requirements that we have as an MPO is to adopt a work program that shows how we're going to utilize those federal planning funds oh. to address the, our role and our function as the MPO. So the UPWP really lays out sort of those um, activities, those tasks that we're going to undertake um, as the MPO for the region, who's going to perform the work, the schedule for the work, any resulting products from that work, uh, funding, uh, the amount of funding or work effort for those activities and tasks, and a summary of the total amounts and sources of the federal dollars and, and our local matching dollars to match those federal dollars. Um, I, I do want to note before we move on that this is a unified planning work program. This is not just a Dr. Cog work program. This also captures major transportation planning activities that will be undertaken with any other federal funds. So any major planning activities that CDOT undertakes within the MPO boundary using their portion of federal planning dollars also needs to be included in the UPWP. And then any locally or otherwise funded major planning activities that any of our partner agencies or local jurisdictions might undertake during this period, we also capture those in the, in the UPWP. So in other words, if a local jurisdiction is undertaking a planning study for a major corridor in their jurisdiction and they're using local dollars to do that, we capture those that work in this UPWP. Wow. It's a one-stop shop for the public and our partners to all go and sort of get a sense for what the major planning activities around transportation are happening in the region during that time period. Next slide, Josh. 
Um, the purpose, our purpose as an MPO is to coordinate and carry out that 3C planning process that's continuous, it's cooperative, and it's comprehensive. Uh, it's a multimodal planning process, and it includes the development of our regional transportation plan. In federal statute, it's called a metropolitan transportation plan. Here we call it a regional transportation plan and the transportation improvement program as two key uh, required activities that we perform as an MPO. As you all know, that's done cooperatively. It's not just a Dr. Cog thing. They're done cooperatively with all of you, all of your jurisdictions, as well as our other partner agencies, uh, including uh, principally CDOT and RTD, among others. There is specific guidance about how we include and incorporate interested parties um, in the part in participating in our planning process and get involvement, uh, talk to other stakeholders and get their feedback um, and perspectives in our planning processes. The scope of our transportation planning work as the MPO uh, federal statute lays out specific planning factors that we need to consider and implement through our um, strategies and our planning process. So around economic development and safety, accessibility, the environment, um, modal integration and how different modes of the transportation system interconnect, management and operation of the system, maintaining the system, that's preservation, uh, making sure that the system is resilient and enhancing travel and tourism. So those those planning factors are laid out for us by Congress in federal statute and says our planning process needs to address those planning factors. Now, what, what federal statute doesn't tell us is to what degree and how and relative priorities among those planning factors. So we need to, we need to demonstrate that we're addressing all of them and considering all of them, but we have flexibility to determine what the relative priorities of those different planning factors and to what extent kind of how extensively we address those different planning factors. Um, our planning process also has is performance-based. It has to be consistent with a regional um, intelligent transportation system architecture. So sort of um, ma that management, the technology piece of our system. And then um, we have to prepare a coordinated public transit human services transportation plan, which is in our case is included in our regional transportation plan. Next slide, Josh. To further define the scope of our planning process, the administration, not Congress, um, usually annually identifies particular emphasis areas that the administration is interested in. And they ask us to uh, develop tasks in our UPWP to address those emphasis areas. Um, so in this case, the most, the most current emphasis areas that have been promulgated by this administration include achieving greenhouse gas, role, greenhouse gas emission goals, um, dealing with equity issues, and um, uh, particularly considering um, how we consider underserved and disadvantaged communities in our planning process. Complete streets is now an emphasis area in the planning process. Uh, public involvement, strategic highway network, which is really about uh, the Department of Defense and, and military um, access, federal land management agencies, uh, planning and environmental linkages study, which think of those as more corridor planning sort of, um, of efforts for particular projects or issues, and then data sharing and um, data management. Um, again, the administration says we should uh, address these emphasis areas in our planning work, but they don't tell us how, and they don't tell us to what extent, and they don't tell us what the relative importance or, or um, extent should be within our region. We have got some flexibility to determine in our region, our priorities, our objectives, our issues, determine sort of to what extent and how we prioritize these different emphasis areas and address them in our work. Um, to do all of that, there's a number of things as the MPO that we kind of that we have to do that we're we're required to do or coordinate as the MPO. So I talked about coordinating that planning process overall. It's really important that our work comply with federal law and regulation because that's how we and all of you and our partner agencies maintain compliance and eligibility to receive and expend federal transportation dollars. 
if we got out of compliance, if we weren't doing our work properly, we do run the risk of losing that eligibility. And that would that would not be good for the region or any of our partners. Uh, we are required, as I mentioned, to do this unified planning work program. Uh, we develop a regional transportation plan. That's our long range plan of priority investments and strategies to address our objectives. Our short-term investment plan, which is the transportation improvement program, that's when we actually allocate specific dollars to specific projects and programs in the near term. We have to develop uh, and comply with federal transportation performance measures and set targets for those. We have a congestion management process and we play a really important role in our air quality conformity uh, for the region. There's a whole bunch of other things that we do that we're required to do to support sort of those things we have to do. If we didn't do these things or we didn't do them well, we, we probably wouldn't be able to do the things that we have to do or at least do them satisfactorily. So we collect and maintain and disseminate a lot of regional data. We forecast travel through, uh, through and land use and economic development through our land use modeling and our transportation modeling. We provide a lot of technical assistance to our partners and our local governments. Um, we do scenario planning because the future is not certain. And so we, you all have seen in the past some of our scenario planning work we, where we test different outcomes based on sort of different futures. Um, we, uh, again, provide a lot of um, plan support for our local agency partners. We have the traffic operations program that um, uh, works in signal coordination and partnership with uh, your jurisdictions and our uh, regional partners. We have a transportation demand management program, way to go. Um, and we um, collect and disseminate and manage a lot of regional traffic count um, data to help inform our planning decisions. So as we look forward to developing the next UPWP, we've been considering sort of things that we're currently working on. So these are newer issues um, that have emerged or have been recently added to our current UPWP around corridor planning and community-based transportation plans, obviously the greenhouse gas emission uh, state rules and how we've incorporated that into our planning process. Housing coordination is something that you'll have more of a conversation about um, after this presentation, but it's something that we've been we've been talking about and we've had conversations with you before about. Um, local agency uh, transportation improvement program project support and monitoring that's something we're stepping up our efforts around. Vision Zero and our safety initiatives uh, remains a really critical priority for us that we, we continue to work on. There's some new programs that were identified in the federal infrastructure bill, the, invest, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act or bill um, around congestion relief and healthy streets and reconnecting communities and safe streets and technology. So we're really thinking about how we incorporate those or potentially take advantage of those new federal programs and how we should think about them in terms of our next UPWP. And then we're thinking forward to what, what things we can provide as sort of a best practices institute for you and in partnership with you around new strategies or efforts around transit oriented development, transit design standards, other things that sort of help build on the work that you all have done with us uh, around the greenhouse gas standards, uh, greenhouse gas mitigation measures, future conversations around leveraging transportation and land use. And then finally, before I hand off to Todd, just to give you a flavor of some of the things that we think about as sort of continuing and emerging and even future issues and, and how we might consider them in as we develop the next two-year work program. So we continue, even though growth rates are slowing a bit, we continue to be a grow, we have a growing population and employment base in this region, and that will continue for the foreseeable future, even if the growth rates are declining, that growth is still uh, a challenge for us. The aging population and how that might impact uh, uh, how we approach transportation in the future and think about transportation planning work and the unique needs of older adults and that aging population, continuing to integrate equity and inclusion into both our planning efforts as well as our planning decisions and investment decisions, leveraging transportation and land use, transportation technology and how that might go in terms of uh, autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, all the things around technology and smart infrastructure that might affect our transportation system going forward. Um, transit system optimization uh, in partnership with RTD, thinking about mobility as a service rather than discrete infrastructure, infrastructure elements, 
Obviously, greenhouse gas emissions and air quality continue to be an issue for this region moving forward. Um, how we address complete streets and multimodal safety, uh, integrating micromobility into our, into our system and how that affects travel demand and our transportation planning decisions. The future of travel demand management and telework. How sticky will sort of the pandemic changes in travel patterns and teleworking and those other changes that we've seen over the last couple of years, how long will they last in the future? Are those permanent changes in travel behavior and uh, or are they going to be more temporal and how will that how will that feed into our planning processes? And then finally, we've got, you know, we're doing a lot of analysis and we'll continue to do a lot of analysis around the most recent census data and thinking about sort of our urbanized area, how that might affect our MPO boundary going forward, and then uh, a continuing nagging issue that we will never fully solve is the funding limitations to address all of these issues and achieve our uh, regional transportation goals. So with that primer, I do want to hand off to Todd just to give you a quick overview of the current UPWP, and then we'll we'll work with you to kind of get some, some input and feedback from you all um, as we move forward. Perfect. Thank you, Ron. Um, so first, I just want to take a few minutes and outline sort of what and how this document is organized. So the document historically has been organized into objectives. Traditionally, there has been seven of them, um, like you see on your screen. Um, it's certainly important to um, keep in mind that that is not all what's in the document. Each one of these seven objectives is broken, at, broken down into anywhere from two to 10 activities. Um, each one of those activities have numerous tasks and even some have deliverables, depending on what that activity or objective um, would result in. So we're gonna dive into each one of these individually. So next, next slide, there we go. So first one, uh, program administration and coordination. Um, it pretty much speaks for itself, but it's the, the um, objective that we use to essentially administer the MPO program um, including the staff development, staff training, uh, most importantly, maintaining this UPWP document, providing the amendments to that, and then also coordination with the next UPWP document, a two-year document that certainly will be included within every document that we have. And of course, ensuring that we're compliant with all of those laws, regulations that, um, that we have to do to maintain our MPO status. Uh, objective two outlines planning, coordination, and outreach, and, and it's sort of put into two different buckets. So first of all, increasing the participation and support of the public um, throughout our entire planning process, um, and then also engaging with your staff in all of those activities um, with our partner agencies um, to really to address some of those issues that are consistent with the Metro Vision goals and policies. So things like the public engagement plan, um, coordinating with CDOT, RTD, um, and of course, local partners, including your staff. Um, this would also include any time that we reach out and have a, um, a, a public hearing uh, with the board. So all of those activities uh, planned with the public. Objective three um, details the long range and multimodal planning. Primarily, this is gonna look at the region's long range plan. So MetroVision and the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. But it's also gonna look at the various other modal plans um, that Dr. Cog has created. So um, active transportation, TDM, freight, corridor, community-based, um, and complete streets planning. Um, really trying to incorporate all of those long range plans into one objective. Objective four, uh, project programming, or better known as the really, the, really focusing on the transportation improvement program. And this is really looking to identify and implement those priorities from that previous objective, um, including maintaining and updating the TIP, especially holding those calls for projects with the main TIP calls and also those set asides um, that we certainly will be going forth here um, in the near future. Objective five focuses on transportation um, systems operations, um, really looking to implement um, those priorities identified in MetroVision and the regional transportation plan, 
but looking on strategies to improve the safety and effectiveness of the existing system um, as a whole. So looking at the congestion uh, management process, um, ITS, security and safety planning, um, and also innovative mobility planning. Objective six, uh, public transportation planning or transit, transit activities, uh, looking at those rapid transit corridors, uh, regional bus network, transit facilities, um, working closely with RTD on these activities. Uh, in fact, contained within this objective, there are many RTD-led um, activities and tasks that are included. And finally, objective seven, looking at planning, data, and modeling. Um, so really, we need that data to really implement um, all of the information and all the plans going forward that we are using. So we sort of use objective seven to acquire and maintain all of that critical data, um, data that's used for the travel and land use model, um, information that you'll see within our regional data catalog, traffic counts, um, and of course, working with all of our partners to, to develop that data. So that would also be included. With that, I think that's, again, just a very high level um, of what is included within the current documents. Um, and I will turn it over to Josh, who's going to take us through an exercise to get your opinion on what should be included within the next two year um, planning cycle. Great. Thanks, Todd. Um, so on your screen, you can all see a QR code that you can use to access a Mentimeter exercise. Uh, if you don't have a smartphone on you, you can also enter into a computer browser, menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com, and then enter the code 14016350. And I've also uh, provided that in the chat for you all. Once you're there, if you wouldn't mind hitting the heart button, just so that I know that a few folks are on, and it looks like we are getting folks uh, on. I'll give a couple more seconds. Uh, but once I do change the screen, you do have that code in the chat, and it will also be at the top of each slide. So you won't miss out if you're uh, not on just yet. But I'll give a few more seconds for folks to jump on. I do see quite a few on already, though. Okay, 23, 24. I'll go ahead and change slides. Maybe, if it lets me. There we go. Um, so as Ron went over, uh, we do have 10 uh, federal planning factors that we have to take into account in our planning work. Um, but as he mentioned, we, we don't have guidance in terms of which of those are the most important, which we should be spending uh, the most time on. So if you wouldn't mind going through an exercise kind of to rank those, obviously all 10 are important. That is why we've heard from our federal partners that we need to take them into account. Uh, but maybe some are more relevant to our region than others. Uh, maybe some are uh, needing some additional time for our staff to focus on. So if you wouldn't mind going through and ranking those in terms of what you think our staff should kind of prioritize uh, and spend the most time on, that would be very helpful. And I see a few of uh, those responses starting to come in. I realize you do have to rank 10 of them, so I'll, I'll give a little extra time on this item. I know it's a, it's a lot to work through. Hey, Josh, it's Jessica Sandgren. I'm sorry, I just came in from another meeting. Is this showing up as like a poll or something? I don't see anything. Yep. So um, if you uh, can either uh, use your smartphone or a internet browser and enter menti.com, it's M-E-N-T-I.com, and then it will prompt you to enter a code. The code is 14016350, and that's at the top of the screen as well as in the chat. Um, and once you enter that, you should uh, have the option to provide your responses. One, four, zero, one, what was it? Six, three, five, zero. Okay, thank you. Sorry for coming in late. No problem at all. So 
So I do see 25 responses now, and I think that's about where we were on the other side. I'll give a little bit longer, knowing that we did just have at least one new new person join us. Um, so I'll give a few more seconds. Um, but I am seeing safety, uh, connectivity, accessibility kind of rising to the top. And we went through similar exercise uh, with both uh, internally with staff, as well as with our Transportation Advisory Council, and really saw uh, similar themes in terms of uh, their priorities rising to the top. So I think uh, what we're hearing from all of you uh, is right on target with what we heard from them. So I see 28 responses. I'm going to go ahead and move to the next slide. Uh, it's a similar exercise. So we had eight planning emphasis areas in addition to the planning factors. And again, just wanting kind of your input, um, what are our priorities for the region? What should we spend uh, the most of our time addressing in terms of these eight areas? Uh, just to provide a little bit of detail uh, for those that aren't maybe the most intuitive, uh, strategic highway network is really referring to uh, coordination on access to military sites and federal land management agencies that's working with uh, agencies such as Bureau of Land Management, uh, National Park Service to ensure access to uh, their sites. So I'm seeing some results starting to come in. So it's looking like Complete Streets is holding that first place spot. Um, I'll give a few more seconds. I know we're at 24, and I think we had 28 on the last one. It's looking like complete streets and planning and environmental linkages studies are kind of rising to the top, followed by uh, data work and taking into account equity and environmental justice. Um, so I'll go ahead and move on to the next slide here. So for this, we this is open-ended. We really want to hear from all of you as representatives of your local communities. Um, what types of regional transportation challenges or issues are facing your community uh, that maybe are best addressed at a regional level? So what role does kind of Dr. Cog play in those uh, local transportation issues that you might be facing? Um, and that might be things that we are already doing that uh, you definitely want to make sure that we're continuing to do. That might be new ideas that you have. Um, so I'm seeing access to rapid transit showing up. Um, RTD safety, connectivity of our trail system, access to public transit, integrating our transportation system, dealing with congestion, public transit connections, access to funding, multimodal access, climate crisis, transit. So I'm seeing transit quite a bit. Just so all of you know, um, all of these responses will be provided back to staff um, as they are thinking through uh, their tasks and activities for the new document. Uh, we'll provide this input back to them so they know what your priorities are, what issues you're facing in your communities, um, so they can think through how best to address those as part of their work. So I do see 26 responses. I'll maybe provide few more seconds for you to get responses in if you have any additional ones. Okay, I'm 
going to go ahead and change slides. So our next slide is very similar. Um, able to change it, there we go. Um, but really wanting to know kind of from a regional perspective, uh, the last question asking about your community, but what is the region facing uh, that Dr. Cog is really in the best position to address? Um, might be very similar topics to what we heard on the last slide, but I see funding showing up, uh, definitely something that we are involved with, safety, climate, coordination of our system. Um, okay. And again, many of these are, are similar themes to what we heard, both from what, what staff has an interest in and what we heard from uh, Transportation Advisory Committee members. So definitely some, some strong themes emerging. Being safety, mobility options, funding, data, seeing a lot of those types of responses. So I'll give a few more seconds for you all to get your responses in. Uh, we'll wrap up for today. So I see 20 responses and it seems to be holding there a little bit. Oh, there's one more. So last call on those. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and move us on. Um, so just in terms of next steps, um, as I mentioned, staff is, is currently going through exercises to think through what those tasks might be for the next two year period. Um, so definitely all of your feedback from today uh, will be provided back to them so that they can take that into account during those continuing discussions um, and make sure that they're addressing the region's needs uh, based on what we heard from all of you. Um, we'll, once we have those draft lists of activities and tasks, um, we'll put that into a draft document that will go out for public comment. Uh, we expect that to be uh, from June 14th to July 14th for a 30-day public comment period. Um, once we receive uh, those public comments, we'll uh, make any necessary revisions to the document and then bring that back through um, with TAC in July and then RTC and the board uh, anticipated at your August meetings. Um, so with that, um, that is all of the information we had for you today. Um, happy to take any questions. Uh, Ron, Todd, and I are on the call. so. Any questions you have, we are happy to address. Thank you to staff. Do we have any uh, questions? And in advance, I apologize for any mispronunciations. If I mispronounce your name, please uh, call that to my attention. I am not seeing any hands. Am I missing uh, Mr. Rex? Thank you, sir, very much. Um, I, I just wanted to point out that, let, listen, I mean, this presentation was probably a little bit more than what you wanted, but I thought it was important that uh, that board directors have a better uh, 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 grasp of what the Unified Planning Work Program is. Um, there's a lot of compliance uh, requirements associated with the development or the, the, the running of a metropolitan planning organization. And um, I just wanted you all to see how comprehensive our work program is to actually get us to where we need to get in order to be eligible for all that federal funding that we receive as an MPO. Um, and also that is very structured, right, with regards to the work that we do. And I wanna thank, thank Ron, Todd and Josh and everybody who works within the MPO for, for all the work they do. And, um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the next two years and, and what we have planned. So thank you, sir, for the opportunity. Great, thank you very much. And thanks, I think the presentation was great in terms of giving us that insight uh, and I think it's also very much appreciated by the board, the chance to give the feedback through the, uh, the polling. So thank you very much. With that, seeing no comments, we will move forward on the agenda.
sorry for that delay. Uh, we will continue with uh, discussion on the potential role for Dr. Cog in regional housing conversations. Obviously, this is something we've talked about in a number of settings. We talked about at our board workshop, we've talked in meetings, and we will continue with that conversation. So I will turn it over to Sheila Lynch to start off the conversation. Great, thank you, Chair Conklin. And we're really delighted to be here this evening. Um, we enjoyed the conversation in December and look forward to talking more with you about what a regional housing strategy could look like. Um, our intent for this evening, and I'll just chat a little bit while we pulled up perfect, got the slides pulled up. Um, so our intent this evening is to share information on work that's underway since our last conversation on this topic in December, and then to gain your insights into what a successful regional housing strategy would do for your community and also for the region. And so um, this will certainly help us as staff to shape how we um, how we might uh, pursue funding or partnerships to move this work forward. And I want to introduce, I'm joined this evening with staff from our exceptional regional planning team. Andy Taylor, our regional planning and data analytics manager is here. And also Emily Dauscher is here, our regional planner, and they'll be joining me and sharing information with all of you. Here we go, next slide. Great. So what we hope to cover this evening first we want to provide a little bit of background i know that there are some um, new board directors with us this evening so we wanted to ground us in some common um, and kind of information that we've been through before so i'll quickly summarize some of the discussion we had in december about a regional housing strategy and i also want to call attention in the staff memo we um, included a few reference documents that might help you um, in kind of either refreshing your memory of previous conversations or um, bringing you up to speed on where we've been. Um, those things include information about a board retreat in April where we talked about housing and a board work session that we had in May where we really explored the con uh, connection between regional transportation planning and housing. Um, we'll also, you know, at, I guess, let me back up as um, as staff kind of reflected on the conversation in December and started thinking more deeply about how we may approach a regional housing strategy. We realized that um, our regional plan Metro Vision can play a really important role here and that there's incredible context, but also some strategic direction that may help us as we think further about a regional housing strategy. So we will touch on that. And then we have um, been engaging with our peers across the nation to understand work that they've been doing related to regional housing and um, coordination work they've done in their regions. And so we'll share out some of what we've already learned and there's more to come there. And then we'd also like to share with you just what we have planned in terms of work underway. Um, some of the stuff has already started and um, wanted to call out specifically that we have some plans in place to convene staff from your communities to dive a little bit deeper in the scoping conversation. And then we really wanna spend most of the evening really hearing from you and having a conversation with you that can further define what what kind of work we really want to get into when we talk about regional housing coordination. Great. Next slide, slide please. And we can go one more. We um as I mentioned, there's been several conversations that have gotten us to this point and we thought it might be helpful to just um, refresh your memory of some of the themes that we heard in December when we spoke. Um, certainly, we heard loud and clear that convening, coordination, and pro program management are needed when it comes to regional housing coordination. Uh, several board members identified that one key role we can we can add value in as um, as an entity that brings um, local governments together is that coordination space. Uh, many local communities are already engaged in housing, so we heard that it's really important that we understand kind of what's already been done at the local level and even recognize that um, that there may be communities that haven't had a chance to dive deep. Um, and so making all of this um, coordination very accessible to all member governments. 
Um, we also heard that the importance of regional coordination is also when we think about how we're going to solve some of these challenges related to housing that we want to be sure we're strategic and that we're coordinated so when there are funding opportunities we aren't just competing for the same um, few dollars we also heard that data analysis and technical assistance um, were a key role that dr cog could play in this space um, there, there are many housing challenges that are common across jurisdictions, and there would be tremendous benefit to um, really coordinating some technical assistance um, to address those common challenges. And Dr. Cog's history and expertise in providing data analysis and products would greatly contribute to a regional understanding of what's needed as we move forward. And so understanding what do those growth projections look like and understanding where those might be. With all of this in mind, we certainly need to be mindful of avoiding duplication, that there's been a lot of studies done around housing, and we really need to be strategic about where, where further data analysis um, is needed. We also heard from all of you that policies and programs um, need to be accessible across all communities, that not all communities are starting from the same place, nor are the context of all communities the same. And so it's really important that whatever we do, um, that we're mindful of that. Um, another key point that we heard is that um, communication strategies that are broad, strategic, and impactful are important. And that we, we really have an opportunity here to start developing a unified vision, but also ways that we can articulate that in our own communities in order to um, really get people behind that vision. And we lastly, we heard that overall, we need to develop some shared goals and desired outcomes that will guide this regional work. Great, so now I will hand it over to Andy Taylor, who's gonna walk us through um, the Metro vision as a foundation. Thanks. Uh, so as we were um, sitting down to figure out how to give you an update, we realized Metro vision really is a great place for us to be starting a lot of these conversations as we've been doing this background work. Uh, uh, last time uh, in December, uh, Doug shared with you a slide that looked very similar to this. Um, the pieces of Metro Vision that talk directly to housing about um, our shared vision for different housing options, meeting people of different uh, ages, incomes, abilities, how we can do that through diversifying our housing stock, how to increase supply at different uh, attainability or affordability levels. And then also about accessibility of that transportation connection. So we started there where it's directly related to um, the language in MetroVision, but there's a piece that we also um, didn't bring up back in December. Um, MetroVision does recognize that there are lots of different types of places in this region. We have some shared vision, but there are a diverse set of places and not all uh, uh, solutions, not all initiatives are gonna look the same in each spot. So there are many different types of places, traditional downtowns, we've got uh, great uh, uh, case studies that, that folks use uh, throughout the country of compact mixed use development that's in suburban settings. Um, we have some great corridors. And so we really have a lot of great assets of the region to lean on. And we wanna make sure we're recognizing that as we're considering uh, what type of housing strategy work to start with. Now, one example of those types of places I just wanted to, to share, these are places that are urban centers that are uh, locally identified, but they're regionally designated through MetroVision. Not all those types of places that I listed achieve that same sort of designation. Some of them are just more described through MetroVision, but this is one that's a longstanding component of MetroVision of places that that folks throughout the, the uh, region have identified uh, for wanting to see more growth, um, to wanting to make these uh, important places uh, to enact our regional vision. And so we have 105 uh, that have been identified over, over 20 years um, by 26 different local governments in the region. 
And these are places that are look very different. Uh, they're very diverse, in, even inside this one category. But they're all designed around uh, different modes, not all just transit, but other modes, but to be denser uh, than the surrounding area and mixed use. So they're very contextual. They're not going to look the same in every setting. Uh, that they are supposed to be livable for people of different ages, incomes, and abilities with different housing and employment opportunities, that these are places that we can promote regional sustainability. These are places that we looked at when we were talking about some of our, our uh, greenhouse gas goals, because these are places where we could see potential for shorter trips or trips using alternative modes. Uh, so these are places that play into that part of our uh, metro vision. Uh, but these are also places that integrate well uh, with it, hopefully within the context uh, that they're in and uh, around the ex uh, existing neighborhoods. And MetroVision itself recognizes that there's no one size fits all approach when it comes time to seeing how this plays out locally, that individual communities really will need to see how these, these outcomes and objectives, including these ones related to housing, uh, play out uh, through different pathways, really different initiatives, uh, uh, different policies, but at different speeds. Um, and, but we can see that shared vision uh, be realized. So that's um, a, a key part up front in MetroVision that um, was worth emphasizing here, that, that it's not just the language directly related to housing that we have to build on as a foundation in this housing work, but really uh, that there's other pieces of MetroVision uh, for us to move forward with in this work. And so with that, I will pass it off to Emily, uh, who's going to tell us a little bit about what we've been hearing in our initial conversations with some of our, our peer uh, regions. Thank you, Andy. Um, so to learn more about what uh, peer MPOs are doing in this space, we've been you're reviewing their strategies and programs, but we've also been having a lot of conversations with those MPOs and those um, are ongoing. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so in researching housing efforts throughout the country, uh, one big takeaway is that there's no predetermined structure for regional housing strategy. Uh, there's no universal purpose. There's no universal outcome. Some have opted to center their work on peer research sharing. Others uh, focus heavily on submarkets. Others emphasize data to tell the story. It's no no one size fits all approach. Uh, while we're still researching and talking with peers about their models to figure out what will best suit our region, you know, we know there won't be one model to follow. This does allow us to incorporate approaches that build on existing Dr. Cog work, like what Andy talked about, also around technical assistance, data analysis, and convening. Two examples that we want to highlight are Seattle and Houston. They've emphasized completely different approaches in their work. In Seattle, Puget Sound Regional Council, um, their regional housing strategy addressed growth, affordability, sustainability. And one of their approaches included um, looking at some markets, typologies, and heavy data analysis. Submarkets are a very common approach with regional housing strategies. They link um, areas in a region geographically, but also economically. Typologies look at different kinds of communities and what characteristics they have in common, such as transit or development characteristics, rather than just a geographic location. This ensures that the plan will have recommendations suited for different local goals, and that communities can implement those recommendations in ways that make sense for them. In Houston, at Houston Galveston Area Council, their growth was happening unevenly. So in their suburban communities, some were growing really rapidly, others were pretty stagnant. So to promote growth in some of their communities and help manage it in others, they incorporated a lot of collaboration and convening tools in their plan. Uh, this includes collaboration between different local governments, between governments and stakeholders, governments and developers, and outreach to the general public about housing. So they're able to really learn from each other to strengthen their communities as a region. And it's hard to say what the effects of these strategies are right now, because most of them are pretty recent than the past couple of years. Uh, but what we can say is that the adaptability of a regional housing strategy and the work that Dr. Cog has already done 
will ensure a successful planning process and implementation. So I will turn it back over to Sheila. Great, thanks, Emily. So we thought it might be helpful to just share with you, um, in addition to what Emily was just sharing, um, different things that are underway to, to really further the discussion about a regional housing strategy. So next slide, perfect. Um, so as Emily shared, we're actively engaging with our peers across the nation. We plan to summarize what we've learned and share that with all of you once we have had all those conversations. Um, we have also, um, as you're all well aware, that um, the Affordable Housing Development Incentives Grant um, was made possible by uh, House Bill 1271 back in the 2021 legislative session, and 18 of Dr. Cog's member governments have received funding and are doing some level of housing needs assessment or planning, and we plan to bring together um, staff from your communities to hear more from them about what areas of regional coordination they think is most important. We also have been having several conversations with our regional partners. Um, we've been reaching out to groups that um, convene different sectors, so um, Urban Land Institute, which convenes uh, primarily the development community, and also um, chambers of commerce and other places where we can really engage with other sectors to understand when we talk about a regional housing strategy, what are they already thinking, where are their opportunities for partnership, um, and especially opportunities for, for funding this kind of work. Um, we've also been engaged with many of our state partners related to programs that are um, they're standing up right now. Um, the Strong Communities uh, Grant Fund that I know DOLA will be rolling out um, shortly. We've been engaged in conversations to help um, contribute to what kind of criteria they will use to, um, to assess uh, grant applications for that initiative. We've also reached out to our state partners to try to bring more information related to Proposition 123, which was the ballot initiative that dedicate that's going to dedicate tax revenue for affordable housing. And we hope we can bring that um, more of that information to all of you in future meetings as well. And of course, we will be monitoring and tracking developments at this um, legislative session this right now this spring. Next slide. Great. So we want to spend most of the rest of the evening um, hearing from all of you. So we have structured a discussion into two key discussion questions just to get things rolling. And we are also going to be using Mentimeter. And our thoughts in terms of how this will work is that we have two questions. We'll use Mentimeter to get kind of the, the juices flowing, get you all thinking about um, responses. And then we'll leave some time to, for you all to elaborate and, and expand on some of your, your responses. And then we'll move to the second question and do the same. So I'm going to pass it on to Andy. He is going to help run the Menta. Mentimeter discussion. All right. Well, I think we've already been through this once tonight. So <laughs> uh, if you could just go ahead and um, go to menti.com, the code this time is 28831870, or you can use that QR code on the screen. And it looks like lots of you know the drill are right now. We've got the thumbs up on this slide. Uh, uh, just help let us know how many of you are um, in there and ready to go. All right, looks like a lot of you have gotten in there. I will go to the first question. So for this first question, it's open-ended. We wanted to learn more about what's out of reach um, for your local government to accomplish a loan uh, that you would want to see addressed by a regional housing strategy.
transitional housing, additional funding, supportive housing, more on funding, coordination with state agencies, yes. Uh, all right, things are coming in. At least we definitely are paying attention to that aging issue, just where we sit uh, with our aids on aging. Looking at land, workforce housing, supportive housing, uh, homelessness, data. Lots of uh, funding being mentioned. Focusing on programs that work. Um, regionally looking for that, that folks contribute and participate in this. Uh, and with folks being landlocked, how to add affordable housing, working with residents, yeah. Looks like we've heard from a lot of folks Obviously, we, we can take more than one uh, open-ended response, but hopefully this has gotten the juices flowing a little bit um, to, to start um, further discussion if anyone has anything they would uh, like to add um, uh, or just to discuss based on some of uh, what you're seeing on screen related to this question about what you would want to see accomplished by a regional housing strategy. And I'm just going to pause the share so that we can uh, all see each other through this discussion as well. So Andy and Sheila and Emily, at this time, we'd like to have a broader conversation with, with, the, with board members. Yes, yes. Don't be shy. Uh, Director Sandrin. Thank you. Um, Thanks for the questions and opportunity to share this information. I think it's going to be great to have Dr. Cog um, kind of looking at this as analysis. I, I just came from a CML board meeting from the subcommittee on housing, and there's a lot of concern about um, some of the bills that are coming forward and just the actual amount of money that, you know, given the current climate, it's not going to go very far. Um, inflation and cost of construction. So there's a lot of fear that while we might have funding available, what is the actual amount available? Which cities and towns will meet the criteria? Um, and, and generally, um, some of the zoning things that are coming up, is that going to match what our needs and wants are um, as municipalities? So I've asked them if they've spoken with anyone at Dr. Cog, given that you guys are also doing this housing assessment, and their answer was no. And so I think that would be helpful for us at CML in the housing subcommittee to have sort of the same data because it is a good discussion piece and it, it does actually help us when we um, look at this as a whole uh, and we're dealing with the, you know, the state through CML and not just the Dr. Cog region. Okay, Director Shaw. Thank you. I, I saw some really good comments come up, um, including uh, affordably purchased housing. Um, and uh, in, in one of the groups I was talking with earlier, um, it came up that, you know, a lot of the uh, condos and townhomes that were being built you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago before construction defects, um, they were they were building for young people, um, but not necessarily, or um, people that were uh, uh, very capable of going up very narrow staircases mm -hmm. with steep stairs. 
and so even if the type of housing was being built that we needed to be affordable, it wasn't necessarily something that uh, could be shared with both the young and old or um, differently abled. And so there's kind of maybe that's that's a place where uh, we could play a role to to try and make sure the quality of the housing, if we can get some that is affordable and for purchase, um, that it would be suitable for multiple generations of uh, people and uh, those of different abilities. Thanks. Thank you. Director Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I wanted to thank Sheila. I think this is great. And, and Emily um, and Andy for, for this presentation. Very helpful. I had a couple of things I want to say. I appreciate the avoiding duplication. And I know that a lot of us have been frustrated with each jurisdiction wanting to jump in and do something. And we've been frustrated by the lack of, of maybe coordination in this area. But I also wanted to say that when I brought this back to my home jurisdiction, there was a lot of caution that th th they expressed a lot of caution about the fact that MDHI has uh, is apparently the federally recognized entity charged with doing the coordination and, and, and enlisting cooperation. And that another entity such as Dr. Cog stepping in to do that may um, be duplication, but it also could be stepping on toes. So I just wanted to throw that out there that that's what I had heard. And um, maybe we can discuss that at some point in this. Thank you. Great, Director Levy. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think this is a really challenging conversation because, um, I, well, what I find challenging about it in this context is like what what has Dr. Cog done traditionally, and what tools do we have available? Um, what tools do exist in statute or uh, tied to the federal funds that we have? versus what we really want to do. And and I my I, I my brain hasn't really made the leap to, well, what could we do if we could get the legislative um, authority to do it, you know? Um, and and I think that's, I mean, that will be to me the the absolute best conversation we could possibly have. Um, but you know, just to to focus in on this conversation we want to have this evening. Um, I think one of, so against the backdrop, we do have the governor's agenda and we're all hearing about it from different sources and having different inputs. And we're members of Boulder County's in CCAT and some are in CCI and there's CML and, and the MAC. And, and so lots of conversations are going on. And I think one of the things that is really challenging about what he, what the governor wants to do is that we don't have a way to do regional housing strategy, and so everything is happening, you know, being um, uh, that that's being discussed is going to have to be implemented by individual jurisdictions that don't want to give up any of their land use authority, and and I think the same with what we may you know putting the governor's agenda aside. Um, I think the biggest challenge is that we really do need a regional strategy, but yet, how do we bring that about without a you know any of us saying we will relinquish some of our authority? I that's the the tough nut to crack here, and like in Boulder County. Um, we have a lot of goals and visions and priorities around the economy and interconnectedness and transit. And our policy is not to do, uh, try to do as little housing as possible in unincorporated Boulder County because we don't think that is good land use. We think it fosters sprawl and it fosters 
um, uh, uh, commuting in single occupancy vehicles because uh, low density development can't be served by transit. So we we don't want to do housing in unincorporated Boulder County. We want it done in the municipalities. And for us to be successful at that strategy and have a decent supply of workforce housing, we have to have Louisville and Lafayette and Superior and Longmont and City of Boulder um, and Erie, you know, be willing to join us in that strategy. And so I think having being you know, getting folks on board with, you know, whatever your sort of travel shed and is to, um, you know, to share a vision. I, I think a, I think that's what we really need. And I don't think we have the tools to do that. And, and well, I mean, I mean, we have actually done that to a large extent in, in Boulder County in the form of, in, of intergovernmental agreements among our municipalities. And the fact that Boulder has our comprehensive plan, and I think most of our elected officials buy into that. It hasn't always been the case, but I just think there, it, it's a really incredibly important conversation, and I think we have we're just going to have to think about a lot of different ways, and maybe be willing to, to, um, um, you know, make some regional trade offs and accept some, some housing that we might not want, or give up some things that we might not want to give up. Great. Thank you very much. Director Mercana. Well, uh, thank you so much. Um, so first, I want to say hi to everybody. Juan Mercana, I represent Ward 4 on the Aurora City Council. I'm excited to be here. Welcome. Um, so uh, yeah, I see this as an opportunity and really a necessity for Dr. Cog to kind of grow its scope and change its focus a little bit, right? So now that, historically, this has been a transportation-focused uh, group. But as we're talking about housing, that's, you know, that's something that is really integral to a successful and sustainable regional transportation strategy. Um, and when we're talking about how we're going to get there, um, I want us to really focus in on um, density and more specifically proximity to services. Because as we're having this conversation, we need to reduce vehicle miles traveled. That'll allow us to reach our climate goals. Um, it'll reduce the wear and tear on our roads, which means less you know, uh, resources spent just maintaining that. Um, and that's going to impact all of our land use policies. And I know that that's something that we're currently reviewing in the city of Aurora. Uh, we have a really great uh, internal planning department that is um, taking a look at some of the stuff that I and a couple of my colleagues have brought back from some conferences we've attended. Um, and there's a, there's huge opportunities um, in Aurora and in a lot of the other you know jurisdictions represented on this call. Um, I think of places like along the Havana corridor where we're going to need to work together with the city of Denver. Um, to make the most out of that area. Um, Parker Road down southeast um, towards Centennial, unincorporated Arapahoe. There's a lot of potential there. And of course, in the southeast of Aurora near, um, you know, unincorporated Arapahoe, and also I think Parker. Um, you know, there's a lot of growth that's going to be happening out there. So um, I, I know it kind of, we have a culture of local control here, um, which is something that I really appreciate. But at the same time, this is an issue where I don't think we can go at this alone. So I think the role of us uh, here on this board um, is to kind of come together, have as unified a strategy and approach as possible um, to help steer not just you know, our local decisions here, but also get the state legislature <laughs> uh, on board with maybe finding ways to help as opposed to hinder or maybe uh, cajole us in a direction that we might not all necessarily think is the right thing to do. Um, and I also just wanna mention, this also really does tie into homelessness. Uh, I'm a big believer that if we're going to actually do something about homelessness and be successful at that, we have to work together as a region. Um, I understand that there's some um, apprehension around MDHI and their current approach. Um, I think that, you know, frankly, that's something where I'm going to also elevate Houston since we already talked about Houston a little bit. What they've done over there is an incredible success and it is replicatable, but we have to have regional collaboration to make that happen. Um, they have the advantage of having a lot less jurisdictions. The city of Houston itself is kind of like a slime mold. If you look at it on a map, they own most of the territory in and around Harris County. Um, here we have a ton of different jurisdictions. So uh, I see them represented again on this board. So it might make sense for Dr. Cog um, to maybe become a central agency for addressing our homelessness issues there. And I will, of course, continue to advocate for a um, comprehensive and systemic um, commitment to a 
single, I'm sorry, to uh, permanent supportive housing, because um, that's how Houston's managed to reduce their homelessness rate by 64% over the last 11 years, which is a feat unmatched anywhere else in the country. So, all right. Uh, so that's my soapbox, but that's where I'm at. Great to be here with you all, and I look forward to building a relationship with all of you. Again, welcome. Director Harrison. Thank you very much. And I agree with uh, Director Marcano and a lot of the um, assessments he made as well. Um, I think for in, in terms of Erie, when we have met with our consultant in regard to affordable housing, um, one of the things that really became readily apparent is that there are many levers to try to accomplish that feat. Very challenging, complex levers that um, various municipalities may have the uh, resources to be able to do, whether it's people uh, or funding, um, but recognize that that's not the case for everyone. And so um, what I think would probably be helpful in regard to where Dr. Cog can come in is maybe work on developing sort of a modeling sort of application or something in regard to taking all those factors in that make up that, that you can attack affordable housing from different perspectives and then maybe put it in a way where you can take in other information that comes in there for your particular municipality and then put that feed that information in there and then see where that modeling comes out um, because then that would kind of help in some way help each jurisdiction be able to um, figure out what works best for them given the demographics and the environment that they're in. Uh, I know that's a challenging thing to do, but where we're wrapping, we're trying to wrap our heads around, well, what do we, what do we start with? I mean, there's, there's these mechanisms here that we can try to do. That's, you know, say purchasing um, property, which in Erie is rather expensive, if anybody knows, uh, and it's the case everywhere. That's one aspect of it. And then another aspect is like, okay, what funding is out there, whether it's federal, local, uh, or state, uh, that might be able to help in some regard. And then there's a mixture of both. So I think different levers that we can kind of take a look at and feed that information in would probably be very helpful for us. Um, and, and maybe for other communities can try to take that instead of a one size fits all or something to that effect. Um, I hope that makes sense to those uh, that are here on this call, but I think that's helpful. And also, especially with the fact that we are able to afford acknowledging that we can afford to have a consultant come in at a, an unspecified amount, I'll say, um, others can't. And that spend is you see a whole bunch of municipalities kind of attacking the same thing with spending money on something doing the same thing where they could have used that money in other ways, maybe contributing on the back end to that solution. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Director Barr. Yeah, thank you so much, Dave. Um, uh, you know, I'm not gonna repeat things that everyone has said here, but I, I do agree uh, with a majority of what has been already spoken so far. Um, I do uh, think that like with regards to Dr. Cog's specific role, you know, obviously overnight, Dr. Cog is not going to turn into some sort of giant planning authority and, you know, carrying out the the wishes of every piece of legislature, you know, of legislation that comes out of our statehouse. And like, you know, and I don't think anyone here thinks that is going to be the case either. But I think that the, the levers that Dr. Cog has available are the kinds of the, the tip funding, the transportation funding that we that already exists. And then you know, creating, you know, changing the current incentive structures, gradings, prioritizations of projects to fit more in line with these kinds of new, um, I, I don't want to say new, but these evolving ideas around denser, more affordable, more inclusive housing. And to uh, to speak to board member Levy's point as well, yes, it's not just purely affordable housing, but it's diverse housing, it's infill projects, and how can Dr. Cog use the funding levers and incentives that it already has um, and lean into the kind of legislation that's coming out that promotes that affordable development rather than necessarily taking a spot in terms of doing the planning and recommending? Because um, as was previously mentioned, there are so many jurisdictions already doing that. And Littleton, like others, is, is carefully watching what is happening um, and I hope that in this coming year that we can also propose things that are going to be in line 
uh, with those statewide objectives. So hopefully it will make it easier for us to do those projects if we know that there is also co-financing options available that we have a higher probability of getting in our transportation networks. And I think that is really where Dr. Cog can truly play a role. And I just wanted to point out too, with regards to local control, you know, obviously we don't, none of us really know exactly what that's, uh, what again, what this season is going to turn out uh, in terms of actual legislation. But that being said, um, you know, I think there's also a lot of different ways. And again, I think uh, Board Member Levy brought this up as well, that there are real benefits to seeding, not everything, but small components of one's local control to that larger authority to to for everyone to reap those benefits. And I want to say too, you know, Pikes Peak Regional Building Department is is a good example of this, where they don't necessarily cede local control over everything, but consolidating certain specific types of services like building and permitting uh, and planning departments to have cross-jurisdictional kind of authority. So it doesn't necessarily mean you give up the ability to say, you know, set back distances or parking restrictions, but maybe saying we should have common building approval structures that we can all agree on. And I think those are kind of like good ways to slowly enter into those regional planning, zoning, or otherwise larger efforts. So anyway. Thank you very much. Director Odoricio. Steve. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the comments that, I, that I've that i heard already. And uh, I know everyone hates it when we all kind of talk about other comments, but I got to tell you, Clara was right. Um, we want to, as counties, be able to connect the dots between cities and dense areas. And I think we need to do our best to try to do that. The, the hard part is when uh, cities aren't, um, you know, may, may not want density or to allow some of those things. And so we're having that challenge internally, even within our own, you know, respective families. And so I I agree with the notions that we should be trying to do this uh, regionally. And I honestly think that Dr. Cog already has a way to do some of this. We're starting to see the merging of these issues that before were pretty, they're always related, but you see this, like, these are like merging hard. Like this is like I-25 coming going from three or four lanes into one. And everyone's like, wait, wait, you're supposed to stay in your lane. And all of a sudden now we're like, well, housing is merging with, with transportation, is merging with uh, environmental more than ever before. We knew they were all on the same highway, but now we're starting to see these, these lanes merge. And I think it behooves us as a region to leverage tools like Dr. Cog, who have, I look at it as unparalleled um, infrastructure for collaboration, data sharing, uh, dialogue, and the different perspectives that we have just in this group is, is just, I'm optimistic that we can get through it. Um, but it'll take us to have some tough conversations among ourselves, even within our respective county families with our cities, um, because uh, it, it's not going to be easy. But uh, as uh, I also agree with what Juan said, is that there's going to be some things that are going to be, you kind of have to choose. There's going to be some things that people are going to want to force on you. And those things are going to either be forced prohibitions, don't do it or forced mandates, you have to do it. Or can we work with the states? Can we work together and be more proactive and say, let's, instead of making them forced, let's make them voluntary. Let's incentivize, let's, let's come to the table ourselves because we all know that if you force certain cities to try to do something they don't wanna do, that implementation is gonna suck and it just won't happen. So I think we all gotta do our best to work together and leverage the strengths that we have with this collective diverse group. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Hassan, Hassman, I'm sorry. There, I solved the mute trick. Uh, <laughs> several people have said what I'm gonna say, but I'm gonna say it slightly differently. And that is we have a lot of information across our Dr. Cog membership. And in terms of coordinating with each other, it could be that we can centralize some of that information with some type of form that uh, in, includes successes, programs, and activities, and so that we can access it by not talking to each uh, municipality, but to uh, you know find it in one place. 
So I think uh, Director Harrison and Levy and even Doug have, have hit on that point, but I'm talking about something that Dr. Cog can do in terms of gathering that information and putting it in one place. <clears throat> and one other thing I mentioned previously was having Dr. Cog uh, gather the value of affordable housing and have that available as a resource that we can take advantage of for all of our municipalities. So those are my two comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Director Bowlby. Hi, how you doing? Sorry, I'm uh, not visible all the time today. Um, my concern, has, I'd like to echo with a few things that have already been said. We are a part of a regional housing um, authority, as it were, but the bottom line for how to create affordable housing usually lies with the developer or the people constructing the homes. And those are private interests that we often don't have the ability to incentivize, especially when contracts with the landowner are old. So we're not all similarly situated. And I think that matters a lot. So if you know, you're in on the ground floor when you need to develop something, that's fantastic. If somebody comes before you and you can say, oh, well, we want you to do X, Y, Z as part of the deal, that's doable. But when, you know, 15, 20 years ago, something has been put in place with zoning and other requirements, and you don't have a whole lot to do about that, and you also don't have a budget for it, there's, it's, it's really difficult to do that, which some of these larger cities and entities are suggesting we should do. So I'd like to ask that that be considered in the broader policy framework for the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of comments. Uh, some of you just said we're not all similarly situated, I think is a really good point. Uh, I am a fan of coordinating. I'm a fan of working on these issues. I have some concern about treating everybody the same way. And, and that's where the local control issue comes in sometimes. Um, you know, we have some communities that have a lot of open space, a, a big palette to look at things and to, to possibly do some things. We have other communities that are pretty landlocked. Mine is certainly one of those, a small community, that there are absolute impacts to uh, if decisions are made for us, as opposed to us doing it as part of our planning process. And I really encourage us to think about unintended consequences. Uh, you know, we have, well, uh, just in general, if, if a piece of housing leaves and is replaced by density, is that density necessarily cheaper? Or is that dense housing that we are suddenly making much more expensive? And I think we just need to, in any coordination, need to understand that all of our situations are not necessarily the same uh, and to be looking at and thinking about those unattended consequences as we go towards some of those goals. Director Maurer. Thank you. Um, yeah, good, good discussion. Um, I just wanted to chime in with some of the problems that we're experiencing. We did a housing study, we are still in the middle of it. And we're kind of it's been at it for about seems forever. But um, one thing is that, first of all, we're, we're kind of landlocked. Uh, the only piece of land we have is right near the airport. And then there's this thing called an influence area. And then the airport gets mad at us. And yeah, it's, it's just a tough, tough challenge for us right now. Um, the other is, you know, it was brought up that, you know, developers come in, and they're like, sure, give us some incentives here. We, I think we can help you out. Well, okay, so we're looking at that, but it'd probably be pretty limited what we could offer. Um, but then it also, who's gonna manage that? Who's gonna make sure it remains affordable? So does that mean that now my city needs to stand up a housing authority? So that, that's one of a bigger piece for us right now that how are we gonna manage that if we we're able to go that way? And the other thing is that we're really looking at seriously because we are so landlocked is what homes we do have. And we have a lot of senior citizens and elderly population. Maybe we can split the homes, you know, and uh, allow for them to have two separate accesses. So I was just gonna let everybody uh, know that, that that's one thing that we're really having to dig into. And then, um, so yeah, centralizing the discussion for us would be great. 
because we just don't have a lot to offer and but we really want to be a part of the solution. Great. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Okay, staff. Great, thank you. This conversation is so very helpful to staff. And um, I see that we only have five minutes left. And what I'm wondering is perhaps we can, um, with ment the menti.com, what's great about that is we can give you those questions and you can fill them in um, even at any time. So we could leave that open and have you contribute to the second question. Um, how about we can put the second question up on the screen and I will put the um, the code in the chat. Sorry, we didn't see that quickly, Commissioner Ordericio. Apologize for that. It happened earlier. <laughs> um, but one of the things we thought would be helpful is to just start thinking about um, envisioning what what success would look like. Sometimes that's helpful in kind of zeroing in and focusing on what's important. And so we came up with this question, what successes of a regional housing strategy would make you proudest? And so if everyone wants to spend some time filling that out, or you can think about this and fill it out um, when you have the time. Um, but I want to be mindful of time because I know we don't have much left. So, Chair Conklin, I'll, I'll pass it on to you. Right. Thank you very much. I appreciate the conversation. Absolutely. Um, and as noted, we are running low on time, but thought I'd see if there were any final comments from the, the board. Or Mr. Rex, did you have any closing comments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I really don't, but to thank you again for this conversation. It is tremendously helpful, helpful for us. And um, you know, we'll we'll go back and and uh and have a look at all the comments were made and try to try to propose our next step related to this. Um but uh yeah, I, again, we're you know, we're here to help and whatever we can do as staff, as your staff to to, to help in, in this project, we're happy to do it. Um and to an earlier point, someone made, and we we definitely don't want to be in a situation where we're duplicating what someone else is doing. If we can find a place that is useful and helpful to all, we're here to help. So, please uh, let's continue this this conversation. Fantastic, and I think the the conversation has great value as we hear from each other and and continue to to work towards common goals. And uh, you know, I think we heard some of those common goals as as we were going through tonight. So, thank you very much. Uh, I do not have my calendar open to see when our next meeting is. Hang on. I apologize. Well, actually, it's going to be the same day. It's going to be March 1st. So, uh, and with that, if there's nothing else for the good of the order, we will adjourn. Thank you all very much. Appreciate your time. So appreciate good night. you. Being here tonight. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you very much. Everybody. Take care, everybody. Bye bye.